Hi, I'm Steve Cardellini. Welcome to another episode of Meet the Gaffer, or in this case, Meet the Key Grip. Let's talk about Cardellini clamps. I started making Cardellini clamps in 1992, and the the reason I did is I was frustrated by the clamps that we had to work with at the time. My, my main objective with them was to create a clamp where the jaw faces would stay parallel throughout the range of the jaw travel. And the, Some of the first designs I came up with were really strange, scissoring devices and, and weird things. When I thought of this design, it was so simple that I thought, okay, I have to give this a try because if this works, I mean, it couldn't be any simpler. The shaft is the pin you mount the light on. You've just got two jaws and a knob. I knew there was going to be a certain amount of binding problem, um, so I had to see if I could get to the point where it was tolerable and, and did. I started out making two prototypes out of steel. I was uh, taking machine shop classes at the local community college. So I machined these parts, went to a job shop and had the, the jaws bent, welded it all together, put it on a piece of 5 8 Acme all thread that I then altered into a semi baby pin and gave them a try. And they worked well enough for me to go ahead and invest in molds to then make the jaws out of aluminum, make the knobs out of aluminum, and that's when I, I really started producing them. My sons and I made the first 1,200 Cardellini clamps in the garage, which is right over here, and then when they really caught on, I hired a, a job shop with CNC equipment, computer numerical controlled machines, and then they started mass producing them. I started out making these two models, the end jaw and the center jaw. I decided to, to make both designs because each had advantages. The center jaw was a stronger attachment because the baby pin is always right next to the jaws, where the end jaw was more versatile. It could get into tighter places to clamp it on, and it was the clamp of choice if you wanted to clamp onto a bounce card, a mirror, a piece of plywood, and then put it into a stand because it gave you more shaft to attach to the stand. Um, then as the years went by, um, people wanted larger clamps, so I made a larger version of the center jaw. This one opens to three inches. Then a larger version of the end jaw. This also opens to three inches. And just a few years ago, I succumbed to demands for one that opens even more. This opens to four inches. Um, in my opinion, that's the limit of this design because when it is open at four inches, and you have a load in here and you start to tighten down on it, there's too much stress on the shaft when the jaws are this far apart to, to make ones that open any wider. Then I um, made a version that had a baby pin on each end. So if you wanted to mount two lamps or you wanted to put a lamp on one end and maybe mount a bottomer on the other end, you could use this. Um, this um, I started making for a sound man that worked in, uh, in L.A., and he needed a clamp that would go around the padded handrails at Dodger Stadium, and then he could put his isolated microphone mounts on. And so I started making this, but later on it's become popular for people to use, even to start rigging off of. What people will sometimes use this for now is they'll take a ball head, like this little Manfrotto, which has a 3A16 threaded hole in the bottom. They'll screw this on, mount a GoPro on it, mount an SLR on it. So it gives them an opportunity to clamp a camera wherever they need it, and then they have pan and tilt and lock off capabilities. The most recent one I built um, is what I call the right angle clamp. Uh, I have a distributor in Germany, 
And uh, he told me that there, there's a company in France who started knocking off my clamps uh, very near the beginning of, uh, of my making them. And they started making a clamp they called a twister that had a pin you could rotate 360 degrees and a knob to lock it off. Um, the problem with it is like a C-stand head, if you put the load on the wrong side, it would loosen itself. So I made this one so that it would key every 45 degrees. So you know it won't slip. Once you lock off the, the knob, then you have the pin securely locked in whatever position you want it. That's the right angle clamp. Um, shortly after I started making the regular clamps, people started asking for smaller ones. So I made the mini clamps, the mini and the skinny mini clamps. And then again, at the request of sound people, I made some that had the 3 8 16 thread that they could use for their microphone mounts. With every clamp I send out, uh, I send out an a information sheet that just gives some tips on how to use it and uh, things not to do. The main things not to do are when you clamp onto something, um, Try to avoid clamping it where you're only clamping on to the far edge of the jaws because that puts more stress on the shaft. Uh, it's more likely if you do that and you, and you tighten it, especially if you over tighten it, to either jam the jaw on the shaft or to bend the shaft. Um, the other thing is when you're clamping it onto something, it works much better. Let me show you. If you take the jaws of the clamp and press them down on, into the position you want to have them and then spin the knob up and tighten it, as opposed to just kind of hooking this on here and trying to close the clamp by turning the, the knob. As you can see, it's awkward and it's not very effective. It's much slower. Uh, also, I, I mentioned about jamming. Jamming has always been a concern just because of it's inherent in the design that your resistance is over here and your force is, is over here. Uh, we've gotten better. We've learned a few things over the years so that they jam less now than they used to. But occasionally they will jam if that happens to you. The best way to free it up is to just loosen the knob a few threads. And then what I do is... is grab the back end of the jaw and pull down and that will release it. If it doesn't, then you hit it with a crescent wrench or the, the, the back of another clamp or something and it'll free it right up. Another thing that you should try not to do with your clamp, never use a wrench on the knob to try to tighten it because all you're going to do is overstress and, and damage the clamp. I know we get into situations on the set where you have to make something work. Everybody's waiting for you to do it. And occasionally you have to do those things that you should never do, but try to avoid it if you can. Through the years, of course, I've had a few ideas that, that didn't pan out. Um, I, I've always been trying to improve the Cardellini clamp. And one idea I came up with was a quick release knob. This is a knob that you can put this where you want to clamp it, just run the knob down like that, and then cinch it up. And to release it, you just hit these yellow levers, and it, it disengages the threads of the knob, and you pull it back. Um, I, I never went ahead and marketed this because it's complicated and expensive to make, and I finally decided that as long as you can do this, that there's really no need for a faster knob, especially an expensive faster knob. So I, I didn't do that. And uh, that brings up a good point. If you have an idea for a piece of equipment you want to try to make, um, there are a few considerations, of course. You know, will it work? How do you make it? But one thing you have to consider is it's possible to come up with a fantastic idea that works great, but it's too expensive to be marketable. 
And I had that problem with uh, my second generation candlestick condor mount. We started having uh, problems with the first condor mount not fitting onto condors that the rental houses sent out to us that had expanded metal welded from the middle hand railing down to the floor. And my existing clamp couldn't get past the expanded metal in order to clamp onto the center rail. So I came up with a, a second generation clamp that has a hinging jaw that that doesn't have to pass under the rail it just clamps up and and presses on the bottom of the rail and it worked great and i sold a bunch of them but they were so time consuming for the work that i had to do on them and so expensive for the work i had to pay to have done that i was going to discontinue them and I hated to see that happen because it functions really well. It's a good piece of equipment. So I phoned Lance Snoke that owns American Grip Equipment, and I explained the situation to him. I said, listen, I just hate to see the product die. Would you like to have this product? Are you interested in making the product? And he had manufacturing techniques that made it possible for him to do it and still be able to sell it at a profit which made me very happy because the product didn't die and I buy them now wholesale from him and I resell them. And I, he, he saved a very good product, I think, from extinction. When I made my first product, the candlestick condor mount, um, when I first started selling them, I had no patent on that. So I went to LA and went to a bunch of rental houses to see how many I could sell. Um, I made the mistake of going to a business called Modern Studio Equipment, uh, thinking they were a rental house. They were actually an equipment manufacturer. The owner asked if he could make copies of my photographs so he could show his partner because he wanted to buy some of them. And I let him do that. And two weeks later, he had them up for sale and he was manufacturing them. So I learned that lesson on the condor mount. When I started making the Cardellini clamp, then I got that patented before I showed it to anybody. And the way that I did it, and the way anybody could do it, because I didn't want to invest a lot of money for attorneys, I used a book by a patent attorney named David Pressman, and it's called Patent It Yourself. If you have an idea you want to protect, I think you should at least read this book to see whether you want to go to an attorney or not. But he talks you through the steps of patenting a product and, and gaining that intellectual property. Um, uh, there were copies made nonetheless um, outside of the U.S. because I only had patent protection in the U.S. There is a, a copy in France. I've been told there's one in Brazil, but I've only seen copies of it. There's uh, one, the brand is named Kupo in China, that's a, a copy of it. Um, and then there's the licensed copy, which is the Mathalini clamp made by Matthews Studio Equipment. Not long after I started selling Cardellini clamps, Ed Phillips that owns Matthews phoned me and asked if he could fly me to LA and talk to me about buying the idea. So I did that and we talked, but at the end of our talk, I told him, you know, I'm a, I'm a key grip in San Francisco, which isn't necessarily a full-time job. And making these clamps in, in between jobs uh, is an excellent way for me to make additional money. So I thanked him for his interest, but told him I didn't want to sell him the idea. And I thought about it for a week or two and my fear was that somebody would knock it off, make a cheap copy of it, and undercut my price by quite a bit, and uh, patent lawsuits are very expensive. So I phoned Ed back, and I suggested to him that he make a less expensive copy of it. I, I knew he was gonna make his overseas anyway, so he could make it cheaper, and I said, uh, if you don't make the shaft out of stainless steel, then you can pick up the lower end of the market, uh, people whose only concern is the price, 
and I'll keep the upper end of the market and satisfy the need for people whose where quality is their main concern. And we came to an agreement and that deal worked out very well for both of us for many years. Yeah, there are also several styles of Mathalini. They make uh, the end jaw, the center jaw, the long center jaw, and a few versions of mini clamp. And then they make a, a version that opens to six inches, an end jaw that, that opens uh, two more inches further than this. And uh, if that doesn't satisfy you, they make what they call an extendalini, <laughs> which is a shaft where you can uh, take the knob and the jaws off of a center jaw and screw on a one foot shaft and then put the knob and jaws on out here and, and clamp across uh, an apple box or whatever it is you're trying to, to clamp. Again, if you do that, I would just suggest you be very careful not to over tighten it. Um, when I first started selling clamps and I had made the decision to call it the Cardellini clamp, I had a few sleepless nights because I thought if these things start falling off the grid and uh, like hurting people, that I could destroy my grip career because of them. Uh, uh, as it turned out, it, it went entirely in the other direction. The Cardellini clamp gave me credibility and got me work as a key grip. Um, it also put both of my kids through college and it turned into a much bigger deal than I ever expected. Um, when I was first considering doing it, we looked at how many grips there were in Local 80 in LA and I told my wife, I think when all is said and done, I might be able to sell 10,000 of these things. So I think it's worth a little investment. Um, I haven't checked the count for a while, but it's well over 100,000 uh, just of the full size clamps. And the mini clamps are probably close to 40 or 50,000. Um, Matthews has probably shipped at least twice or three times as many Mathalini clamps as I have Cardellini clamps. So, um, yeah, it changed my life. I mean, uh, it, it gave me credibility throughout the business. I think if I were to, to pass on words of wisdom uh, to prospective uh, equipment designers or equipment manufacturers, um, the main point I'd like to get across is it's possible to do it in the USA. Um, all of my stuff is manufactured in the San Francisco Bay Area where there's a very high cost of living, and yet I'm still able to do it and make enough profit to make it worthwhile. Uh, one thing I said from the start is I would never go overseas to make my stuff. I would have closed the business first. You can do it too. You have to shop around. You have to uh, I always try to use as much existing off-the-shelf hardware as possible because custom fabrication is expensive. Um, the other thing I would say is if you want to start manufacturing a product, it doesn't mean right off the bat you have to go buy a building, buy machines, and you can inch into it. That's what I did. Um, in 1992, I spent $1,300 on molds to cast aluminum jaws to make my clamps. At that time, I was still using knobs that I just bought out of catalogs. Later on, I, I, I made molds to uh, cast those as well. But I never had a huge investment into the business. I just used the money that came in as the product started to sell to increase the product line to enlarge the business. You can inch into it and make it happen. If you get lucky and you have a product that, that everybody in the world wants to buy, then once you've, you've made a bunch of sales and you have some capital, then you can look into getting a building, hiring people. Actually, I never did that. My business has always been in my house. When I was still gripping, my wife would cover me when I was working and she would box up the products, send out the, the products and the invoices. And then once I retired, then I've been doing it. But it's been a one-man show the whole time. 
The most notable other products I've come up with besides the uh, Condor mount and the Cardellini clamp are what I call the Cardellini tri-hat. It's kind of a cross between a tripod and a hi-hat. Um, I wanted something that was very versatile. I mean, all the leveling is out here. This comes with 6-inch and 12-inch legs. You can decide where the the legs are going to land. You can put it tight up against a wall by doing this. This is a wonderful piece of equipment in the back seat of a car if you're doing an over-the-shoulder shot or something because you can avoid the hump. Um, if it turns out you need a longer leg, you just throw in a piece of inch and a quarter speed rail. And not long after I came up with this, well, this is kind of a funny story. I woke up at two or three o'clock in the morning one night with the idea that I should make a quick release tie down for Mitchell base heads. Something that would eliminate the separate knob and screw so that you didn't have to reach under each time, find the hole and get it started while the whole crew was standing around watching you and tapping their feet and the sun was going down. So this is what I eventually came up with. It took me about a full year to figure out how to do it, but I came up with what I call the Cardellini headlock. This device mounts permanently to the bottom of the head, and when you turn this knob, you can see these three angled jaws radiate out and lock into the bottom of the Mitchell mount. One thing I found that surprised me when I started making both of these pieces of equipment was that there were no standard dimensions for a Mitchell mount. The one on a Fisher dolly was different than the one on a Chapman dolly, was different than the one you'd find on a tripod. So when I made this, I had to make sure that these jaws would contact on a wide range of thicknesses of Mitchell mounts. And to this day, I haven't found any that they don't fit on, but that was one of the challenges. So. I think of everything I've made, I think this is the one, the product that I like the best. I think this one is the most clever, if I can say that about my own work. In April of this year, I turned 70 years old and I decided that it was time to not spend every day of my life uh, putting clamps in boxes and shipping them around the world. And so uh, on May 1st, I sold 80% of the assets of my business to Joe Sullivan, who owns the company that has been making my products for the last 20 years. So um, I'm continuing to make the non-clamp products and sell them through Accurate Manufacturing, which is the new company, or actually it's not a new company, but it's a company that's new to Cardellini Clamp. This has now freed me up to play with grandchildren, hang out, get, get those chores done that have been on my list of things to do for the last 10 years. And uh, yeah, it's a good time in my life right now. Well, thanks for watching and we'll see you again next time. The first piece of equipment that I invented was the candlestick condor mount. Um, before it existed, we used to either take a junior riser and chain vice grip it into the corner of the man lift or sometimes collapse a combo stand and chain vice grip that in. And a good friend of mine that's a gaffer was on a job and somebody moved the condor very suddenly left to right the way they will do and it sheared off the top of the combo stand and the lamp came crashing down to the ground. So I thought, okay, this is something that needs to be improved. And so I just made a condor mount that was so heavy that I knew it, there's no way, not heavy in weight, but heavy in strength, that there's no way that it could possibly break. This is the newer version of the candlestick condor mount. Uh, the way it works is it 
has a pin like the old one did that keys into the expanded metal floor of the condor. And then it has adjustable clamps that you can adjust to go on to the middle rail of the condor mount and the top handrail. And what's different about these is they don't have to pass under the rail like the old ones did. This one has a jaw that when you tighten this knob, you can see the jaw hinges up and clamps onto the bottom of the rail. At the same time that that's happening, this pin is going through a hole in this slider and putting pressure against the post itself. So the one knob now locks it off to the post and to the rail. So you lock off your top rail, you lock off your bottom rail, and this is your safety cable that goes around the handrail and around the bale of the lamp in case something goes wrong and the lamp somehow comes out of the condor mount. Another thing that you can do with this is you can take this bolt out of the bottom. You can pull the clamps off and reverse them, put them back on, put this bolt back on as a safety, and you can undersling a lamp below the basket of the condor. So there'll be times when you want a light coming in a window and you don't want the basket in the shot. This way the lamp is the lowest thing in the rig and you can bring it in your window without being seen.